It is crowded and chaotic. Tonight, thousands of migrants, mostly from Honduras, are stopped at the Guatemala-Mexico border. Migrants and refugees arriving at the Belgian town of Le Pan on the border with France are turned back. Hundreds of desperate migrants have forced their way through police lines at a holding camp near Ruska in Hungary. Anger at the Greek border with North Macedonia. Rumors of an open border spread on social media and thousands of asylum seekers came. As waves of desperate migrants sprint from a holding camp in Hungary, a camerawoman appears to trip a man running with his child in his arm. The migrants want access to a transit camp where they can register as refugees and carry on with their journey. Closing the border will be a profit-making operation. We've run out of room. I'll just close the border. The uprising has its roots in the southern Syrian city of Daraa, where protests erupted in March 2011. By well, late April 2011, following some protests against the government, uh, which started as peaceful protests in Daraa, and later became much more politicized, and violence has become a factor in it. Security forces reportedly opened fire on demonstrators, killing several. Late April 2011 was the first time Turkey received about 200 people. On Sunday, about 250 Syrian refugees made their way across the border to Turkey, seeking temporary shelter in rural villages and dusted tinted camps. But the numbers have increased drastically from 2012. Although Turkey was trying to uh, accommodate the displaced people in, in the camps around the border, people also started settling in, in urban areas. So um, from 2012, we see a, a incremental increase in the numbers of people arriving. At last count, there were more than 50,000 Syrian refugees, but the Prime Minister's office says the Turkish government's prepared to host up to 100,000. And obviously, from 2014, there was more realization that the Syrians may be here for longer periods, which also led the government to adopt more midterm policies. And that's meant that Turkish authorities have had to evolve and adapt their policies to cope. Syrians are now under what's called temporary protection status, and that means they will not be forced to go home. Many of these Syrians were moving from Turkey to Greece by boats. So the images of the Mediterranean at first were really images of the Aegean route. But when the Aegean route was blocked by the EU-Turkey deal in March 2015, they simply had to find another way. So then we see a shift to a land route through the Balkan, or we see more people on the Mediterranean route to Italy, to Spain. Just like in Greece, Bulgaria relies heavily on collaborating with Turkey to stop people before they reach the European border. The fence itself is just a final obstacle. Whenever there are more security measures on one route, the migrants found another route. Europe's land borders stretch for thousands of kilometers from Finland to Greece, presenting a constant challenge to national authorities. Often in difficult situations, they turn to Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. To give you an idea, for example, if there were more Frontex, actually, vessels along the Aegean islands, then you could actually see that more migrants were using the land route from Edirne into Greece. Prime Minister confirmed Turkey's commitment to accept the rapid return of all migrants coming from Turkey to Greece that are not in need of international protection. So with the Turkey-EU readmission agreement, it had really a deterrence effect. Initially, it contributed to an overall drop in migration. But towards the end of 2014, migrants found new entryways and numbers went up again. So now people know that if they cross through Turkey to Europe, they will be sent back. So what happened was the Mediterranean route has began to be more utilized. Now, as a whole, the EU has definitely shifted to a bordering policy, but the borders do not remain within the European continent. Actually, through things like the EU-Turkey deal and later agreements with Libya or Malta, Morocco, they are externalizing their migration control and their border control. In exchange, Turkey was promised billions of dollars in aid and other concessions, including visa-free travel for Turkish citizens. The EU says it's so far allocated $2.3 billion out of the $3.2 billion it earmarked. With these agreements, 
the EU offers financial support. With the EU-Turkey deal, they gave 3 billion euros to Turkey. There is a financial incentive for these periphery countries to enter such agreements. The top 10 refugee hosting countries account for only 2.5% of global income. I think it's very important that the responsibility of Western countries to support those countries that are hosting refugees. These three countries, they are actually developing countries, especially Jordan and Lebanon, but with the 6.5 million refugees, they take the burden of the refugee issue, whereas Europe or America wouldn't take the burden of the refugee issue. No one country can shoulder the entire responsibility. The U.S. took in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 Syrian refugees. The, the international community needs to step up, it needs to do more. And also the conflicts in Africa, many of the failed states have not been really dealt with by the international community. They are not doing much to address the root causes of migration coming from that continent. And at the same time, they are closing all the other routes where people could have a relatively safer passage. That's why they're using the Mediterranean Put simply, the EU are paying North African countries, above all Libya, a nation in chaos without a functioning government, to catch the migrants and keep them. With these agreements, they put the pressure on countries that are often not equipped to deal with this influx of migrants. So in February, the Italians paid the Libyan government $236 million to divert migrants right back to Libya. Most of these migrants end up in one of the detention centers across Libya where they wait to be deported. What we see is migrants from sub-Saharan Africa who are trying to make their way to Europe being stuck in limbo in countries like Libya and entering the irregular economy, the informal economy, or they are kept in detention centers where they are tortured, which I see as a direct result of the EU's externalization of borders. The Libyan route has been virtually shut down, but at a terrible human cost, in which European leaders with their domestic concerns are complicit. This migration debate has been between governments, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, and also private companies. Governments are bargaining over were some other political issues in the context of migration. They all see this as a zero-sum game. Around the world, we present refugees with an almost impossible choice between three options, encampment, urban destitution, and dangerous journeys. Politicians frame the issue as a zero-sum issue, that if we benefit refugees, we're imposing costs on citizens that refugees are an inevitable cost or burden to society, but they don't have to, they can contribute. The subject of this issue is people. We don't see this. This is not a zero-sum game. We are talking about lives of people. The research shows that the more strict controls that you have, the more walls that you build, you actually create more permanent migration. Because once that person could cross that border, I mean, in whatever status, the entire idea for that person is to be able to stay, right? Research shows exactly the opposite. The numbers are not really decreasing because of the border controls. The types of migration is changing. Actually, the result is exactly the opposite of what they want. Very few refugees make it to the richer parts of the world, fundamentally because those countries are closing the doors to them. This is a global crisis, not just a Middle Eastern crisis, and it needs a genuinely global solution. Instead of creating regular means for people to be mobile, all these like policies of building walls and making it harder for people to be mobile, it is not really working. And it is creating exactly the opposite of what this populist rhetoric actually sees. President Trump is increasing his rhetoric on immigration with less than five days until the midterm elections. At the White House Thursday, the president unveiled a plan to deny asylum seekers, saying anyone who tries to enter the United States between ports of entry will be automatically sent back. Enforcing these kind of borders and these kind of restrictive policies doesn't stop people from having to escape. So in a sense, this is providing a false sense of security that once you have this ban or this wall or this restriction that it's going to solve the problem for you. At best, it's a temporary fix. And at worst, it's just going to make the actual problem worse. Unless you create more regular means for people to be mobile around the world, there is no way to stop this. And I found incredible irony in that so many people were losing their lives Lives, not because of the conflict, but on the way out. I would read about refugees that put their children in rafts to escape. When they were asked why, they said it was because they didn't have a better option, that the water had become safer than the land. We cannot prevent migration because as long as we know human societies, humans always move. If anything, actually, 
the current situation is an arbitrary situation because the world in which we live, where we are circles, are a land mass with borders and prevent people from moving from place to a place, it's actually a rather new phenomenon. People always move around the world and they will always move around the world. There will always be new routes, especially if the countries do not take their fair share from accepting refugees. There will always be facilitators and sometimes for illegal routes. There will always be new ways to migrate. People have been able to move away like they always did, like all of our grandparents and great-grandparents did, from famines, from pogroms, from wars. A third of Ireland migrated, a third of Sweden migrated, a third of Italy migrated. That's what people did in the past when there were problems. Because in the end, you can't really stop people from moving. If you are forced from a place, or if you are in a place but your rights are not met, or you have no livelihood, you will continue to move. Humans are historically nomadic people. We've always been on them. Human beings are migratory animals. <laughs> we have always been migratory animals. We're never going to stop. It's like thousands and thousands of years, but we try to control movements and motion. But that's an illusion. It's never going to stop. The question is that whether we should or we can stop the migration. The question is that how we actually manage and govern migration. That how do we actually think about migration? What do we mean by migration? Rather than, because this all depends on your perspective. If you see migrants and the people coming from outside as alien, enemy, a threat, then you're actually going to think that you have to protect yourself if you identify with it. But if you actually see them as fellow human beings where you can establish a new life, then you have an entirely different uh, perspective.